everyone and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during this presentation today, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. I'd like to welcome everybody to the June 16th edition of Crop Talk. And uh, this week, uh, we're going to be uh, looking at uh, the pea crop uh, for, for a bit or for most of the webinar. We're going to be uh, uh, talking about uh, its uh, progress, I guess, in the field as well as uh, we got Dave Kaminsky on. And Dave is going to uh, give us uh, some insight into some disease ID, uh, getting ready for fungicide application, and just uh, kind of taking care of that crop as, as it grows. Uh, I was in a few fields yesterday and uh, the pea crop is definitely uh, taking off and, uh, and looking pretty good right about now. So uh, that's good to see. Before we get going with David though, uh, just a couple slides to I guess uh, talk about what's happened over the past week. Um, uh, we got some well needed rain and uh, I think uh, in a lot of areas uh, we got uh, enough to get things uh, going and, and growing for, for a few weeks here. Uh, most areas reporting some rain, uh, some a little less than others, but in general uh, a, pretty, a pretty good uh, rain that uh, is going to help out a lot of producers. Um, the rainfall was definitely welcome, but uh, like anything else, uh, you know, it, uh, we get some problems maybe that occur with uh, with the rain, and in some areas we got uh, uh, heavier rain. We got some um, rain that uh, came in uh, large amounts, so we've got some pooling in some areas. So some crop in some of the lower areas is probably uh, going to drown out. Uh, one of the things that I've been dealing with the last couple of days is uh, is crusting. Uh, there was uh, before the rain, uh, a lot of producers were doing some reseeding because of uh, of of the uh, of flea beetles and and just some germination issues. And uh, so uh, now we've got the issue of uh, the rain coming hard and fast in some places and forming some crusting on some la on some fields. And now the uh, the issue of that uh, those crops coming through the ground, and uh, we'll be uh, talking about that a little bit more in the uh, uh, questions part of uh, today's webinar. Flea beetles continue to be a problem. Um, guys were spraying still yesterday for flea beetles, so it's something where the we uh, you know hope the rain would slow them down, but it just seems with uh, after the rain we got a, nice, a lot of nice warm conditions again, a lot of heat, so the flea beetles are still fairly active. Another big issue we're facing is is wind. Um, a lot of uh, wind over the last uh, last week here, and many producers are starting to fall behind uh, spraying uh, because of it, and uh, so that's starting to become an issue as well. And with that, uh, crop staging is starting to become a, a concern. Um, and I guess just one last thing here: uh, reseeding deadlines are coming up, so uh, anybody that's still in the situation where uh, uh, they need to be uh, doing some reseeding. Uh, those days are definitely coming close. Uh, just a couple comments about uh, winter wheat and fall rye. I was in some of those fields yesterday, and um, in general, um, average to below average, I think this year. Um, I think just the cool temperatures, the dry spring, and then uh, some winter kill. Uh, these crops just hadn't weren't able to uh, to uh, fight all those things off. So we definitely have a lot of fields that are patchy and uh, definitely not going to be the the yields that uh, that we were uh, normally expect of some of these crops, uh, mainly because of the patchiness. So uh, it's kind of a little bit of a general review of, uh, of some of the things that's happened over the past week. Uh, with that, I think we'll turn uh, it over to uh, David, and David will start his presentation on uh, on peace. Okay, thank you, Lionel. Just take me a moment to uh, get my screen up, or has it already appeared? We're still waiting. Acknowledge the show my screen and. Uh... No, I can see it. It's good to go. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great, thanks, Laurie. 
Well, thanks for inviting me to talk about uh, diseases in field peas and uh, management, particularly with fungicides. I'm glad that Lionel showed that um, precipitation map at the beginning because um, if I'm going to go sideways for a minute, uh, that explains a lot of the uh, the alarming uh, extreme values for fusarium head blight on the western side of the province. Now I know that most of your crops are not in a vulnerable stage yet, but uh, that rainfall earlier has really driven the model to uh, maybe overestimate the fusarium risk right now. Here in the Red River Valley, we are still kind of crushingly dry. So that's a bit of a, a role reversal. Okay, on to um, disease management in field peas. And are fungicides necessary? I should also point out that this is a collaborative effort between myself and Dennis Lang, our pulse specialist. Dennis was not able to be with us this morning, but he has contributed to this presentation. So I'm trying to advance to the next slide. Now, um, field peas really make up a small segment of the crops that we grow, but as you know, it's a growing segment and uh, there has been a lot more interest with uh, the processing facilities that have been uh, set up recently in Manitoba. What are the major diseases of field peas? Well, um, at one time, powdery mildew, which you see on the left, was an issue. However, that's fairly easily dealt with by genetics and breeding. So it's something that has almost disappeared, but <clears throat> now there are a few varieties which are a little more susceptible. So we might see that again. On the right-hand side, um, we have anthracnose, which is a fungal disease, can be seed borne, um, looks a little bit like some of the Ascochyta species that attack peas. In the middle, the most important disease of field peas, and that is mycosphorella blight. Um, of course, if there are pods on a plant like this, it's later in the season, but those symptoms on the leaves are the ones you'll see first in the spring, and they'll be in the lower part of the canopy moving up. They're always angular or almost a, a blocky shape, uh, and they are anywhere from brown to purplish brown in color. Quite distinctive. So mycosphorella blight, what is it? As I said, it's a fungal disease. Um, can sometimes be known as the Ascochyta complex. There are actually three species of, of um, Ascochyta that attack peas. Ascochyta penodes is the one that is most common and its sexual stage is called Mycosphorella penodes. There is also though Ascochyta pisi and Ascochyta pinodella. <clears throat> so um, symptoms of those might be a little more variable. Why do we have different names for the same fungus? Well, in this case, it's a matter of asexual stages versus sexual stages. And Mycosphorella does have a known sexual stage. It will survive longer on the residues of previous crops. And it produces a type of spores that are not just spread by rain splash, they are spread by wind currents. So they can move significant differences into neighboring crops. So if you're growing a pea crop immediately beside where peas were grown last year, it's likely that the whole crop is vulnerable. Genetic resistance to Mycosphorella blight is insubstantial. Every variety that is currently listed in the um, Seed Manitoba for 2021 is listed as only fair at best. So this is the disease for which fungicides are most commonly used and are generally warranted. <clears throat> Okay, um, when I first started as a plant pathologist, there were only a handful of fungicides available for mycosphorella blight. 
that has changed substantially over the years and now there's now more than a dozen different products. Um, the majority of them are uh, products that belong to BASF and Syngenta. Um, you can read the names there and some of those are, are quite new. Miravis Neo only came onto the market last year. Um, when you look at the labels or in the guide to field crop protection, um, you will see that sometimes um, fungicides are only listed as giving suppression of this disease. That uh, middle column is suppression or control. C is for control and S is for um, suppression. And we have one other category there, ABO. And that stands for, <clears throat> I don't know, but uh, it's not generally a, a fungicide, a mineral that is uh, used for microsorella blight. Um, the next column is staging. And there are three categories there, starting with um, PDD, which, oh, I'm drawing a, a brain cramp at the moment, but that's the earliest stage. Oh, it's prior to disease development. So if you're going to be using Acapella, for instance, um, it's got to be there before the disease begins. It's more of a, a coating and a prophylactic activity. The other ones are either first sign of disease, FS, or early flowering. And that is going to be um, a bit later in the season. There are two other columns I'd like you to consider. The first one is pre-harvest interval. And some of them are fairly long, that is in days. Some of them are up to a month or even more um, between the time of fungicide spraying and harvest. And the final column is um, number of applications of that product that can be used. Uh, it's generally one or two. Copper could be applied a number of times or many times. Um, the asterisk denotes that those products may be used twice in a crop, but not sequentially, or you will likely be driving um, resistance in the pathogen. There would have to be another product um, in between um, and probably something that has a, a non-systemic effect. Keep losing track of how to advance the slides here until meltdowns this morning. Okay, on to fungicides. Um, Here's some pictures provided by Dennis about fungicide spraying and the times that it's likely to happen. Um, from Saskatchewan, we have a, a risk checklist um, which can help us to evaluate whether or not we should be using fungicides. And there are four categories, crop canopy, leaf wetness or humidity, especially in the middle of the day, the five day weather forecast, and whether or not symptoms are appearing on plants. And you go through each of these and give that risk factor to it. So in the example we're using, uh, we have a normal plant stand, um, in Saskatchewan, they're dealing with both lentils and peas. So here the word is lentils, but it's similar for peas. Uh, a decent stand, we would give a risk factor of 15. Um, if we have only moderate leaf wetness, sometimes it's disappearing in the noon hour period. Uh, we're in the mid range there and we have a risk factor of 20. If the forecast is for light showers, we'd add 15. And finally, if um, the symptoms were still slight, only 20% of the plants showing symptoms, we give it a, a risk factor of 15. And then we add up all of those risk factors. And this is actually the threshold in your fungicide spraying decision. It doesn't sound like it's a high risk of disease, but you're on the verge of the fungicides being necessary, particularly for Microsorella blight. What about fungicide timing? 
The ideal timing is at or just before early flowering. Um, Lionel and I were discussing where the crop is. I have some peas here in the Red River Valley that I planted uh, just before the end of April and they're already at the nine leaf node stage. So that's getting very close to the time when you would absolutely want to be inspecting your crop to see what's present. Um, sometimes a little bit later, 10% flowering is, as you've seen, an acceptable timing for fungicide applications. And there's a reminder of how the risk values are, are calculated. Um, there was a website noted where you can find that uh, calculator for yourself. Um, and if you view the recorded uh, version of this uh, webinar, you'll find that there as well. Some of the other, I have to say, minor diseases like powdery mildew, as I said, it's almost an historic disease. However, <clears throat> there are a couple of varieties in um, yield Manitoba or seed Manitoba that are listed as not very good, or in one case, poor. Um, the variety Striker, which is a green type, is listed as poor. So you may see powdery mildew from time to time. It is dew forming conditions that favor this disease. Hot, dry days, cool nights. And um, so it's one of those diseases that can sneak up on you if you think that it's dry most of the time. Having that uh, powdery coating on the leaves can interfere with desiccation of the crop later on. Um, there aren't that many products registered for powdery mildew. Copper is one and it's inexpensive, but not always that effective. This is anthracnose, um, and the symptoms of anthracnose and other fungal disease are very similar to those of the other Ascochyta species on peas. Um, lesions that are dark brown or purple around the edges, but um, light tan in the middle, and you might see sporulation within those spots. Um, for anthracnose, um, it's not a disease for which fungicides are generally recommended. Um, they, this disease can be seed borne, so there is now a, a seed treatment that's registered. And um, this disease we saw maybe emerging 10 or 11 years ago, and it does not seem to have amounted to much. There is another disease, a bacterial blight on peas that can have a similar appearance, especially down within the crop canopy. And of course, bacterial diseases are not controlled by fungicides either. Um, one final fungal disease that I wanna talk about, uh, Dennis says it's a rare thing to see white mold or sclerotinia in the pea crop. However, if you've got volunteer canola in your peas, it's a good chance you might. Um, with the varieties we have now, they are smaller, semi-leafless, a lot of tendrils, and that doesn't make for the dense canopy that uh, sclerotinia or white mold takes to thrive, but it's just one to be aware of. And if you are using fungicides to um, control mycosphrella blight, uh, you will have an impact in most cases with white mold as well. Okay, um, Lionel, how are we doing for time? I did have some slides about root rots, um, but... Um, yeah. We're good, David, so you could keep going. We're good. Okay, Aphanomyces root rot is the one that is emerging as a concern in Manitoba. And the reason is that it has such a, a long life cycle, it has thick-walled oospores in the root tissue. And so if you've grown peas in the past and seen Aphanomyces, you're going to see it even six years afterwards if you haven't grown the crop that many times. Um, the plants on the left are healthy. Um, we've washed off the roots. They are a little bit brown, but uh, otherwise clean. On the right-hand side, we have plants that are affected by Aphanomyces, and most of the root system, especially the, the larger parts, are completely brown and collapsed. Nothing we can do about it with um, seed treatments, 
or fungicides. So um, it's one definitely to be on the lookout for. And many people working in the industry are keeping their eye on this one. The other garden variety root rots include things you've heard about before, such as Rhizoctonia, Fusarium, and Pythium. Each has its own range of uh, environmental conditions where you're likely to see uh, it appearing, um, but they're very common in the soils and they have overlap with other crops as far as what they can attack. So um, just to be able to distinguish them a little bit, Rhizoctonia in the top left um, is kind of a shin disease. It's on the main stem and it works its way above ground as well. So you might see it even before you are pulling or digging plants. Uh, Fusarium root rot will take much of the secondary root system. So you get these um, stubby roots, but it's entirely below ground. You can see there's a good inch or so of uh, white tissue before you're getting to the, the green that is indicating the soil surface. And Pythium root rot attacks the fine feeder roots. So it might not be as evident as it in, is in this uh, picture. Um, it thrives in really moist soils. It's one of the water molds. So in a year such as we've had, I don't expect to see much of that. Much more likely we're gonna see Rhizoctonia and a little bit of Fusarium. So that's what I have for you today. I'm just going to spin back to again show you that um, slide for calculating your risk. And that's where the link is to um, SAS Pulse in Saskatchewan. And except that will take a moment to swing back to that uh, fungicides that are available. Are there any questions? Yeah, while well, we're going, yeah, there's the slide now. But um, uh, one question has come in is, uh, I've been told I might have to be looking at two applications of fungicides on, on my piece. Uh, what are your comments about that? Well, um, the earlier one is the one that is probably going to be paying the most dividends. But if we have wet conditions persisting, beyond the time of application, you should be monitoring the symptoms. And if they appear to be moving up within the crop on the foliage, um, you want to be sure that you have protection for the pods. That's where the real yield damage can occur. Um, so in some cases, a second application is warranted. Um, is the person asking being told by um, the company they're contracting with? I think that's what uh, the gist of it was. It was, yeah, it says, uh, I've been looking, uh, I've been told I should be looking at two applications. Um, and then just what are your comments? So I'm thinking they're being advised that there may be a plan for two applications. Okay. Yeah, it, it can be quite possibly that it, it is required. Uh, However, often the first application is the biggest bang for the buck. Okay. Um, sometimes at harvest, I have patches in my fields that go almost completely black and have very few pods. What do you think might be causing that? I expect that's more likely a, a root problem, especially if it's in the lower areas where water sits and accumulates. Um, pea crop, first of all, doesn't tolerate wet feet very often. And it's uh, something that has driven field pea production out of the valley for some time and more into the western part of the province, um, but not as likely to be associated with a foliar disease, more a, a root pathogen. Okay, so it's like more like some type of root rot then, right? Yes. Okay. And fusarium would be the most likely and uh, very common pathogen there. Okay, so that's fusarium wilt you're talking about there? No, uh, fusarium root rot. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, those are uh, the questions I have so far. Um, 
and uh, you're going to hang on for the panel, David. So if we get some more coming in, we'll uh, we'll be asking you, okay? Sure thing. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks for coming on, David. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to make a couple comments on peace because I was out in quite a few uh, the fields yesterday uh, looking at uh, at the crop, and um, it uh, has come along uh, fairly well. It seemed to handle the conditions we've been having, taking advantage of the early spring moisture, and then this recent rainfall is definitely going to bring it on. Um, Disease-wise, like uh, David had mentioned, I uh, uh, I haven't seen a whole bunch yet, uh, but they were just getting to the point where uh, a lot of the fields would be looking at their first application uh, of a fungicide. Uh, but uh, you know, probably within the next week here, I would think is when guys might start scouting to see if it's worth uh, spraying. Um, one of the things I did do too is I dug up some uh, some plants. Uh, I didn't have all the tools I needed, so I wasn't able to get everything uh, washed clean and everything. But uh, you can definitely see the nodules that are forming on the pea plants. Uh, got that nice pink color to them, so they're uh, definitely uh, doing their job. And another good thing for uh, for helping the the peas uh, get growing for this year. So uh, in general, pea crop uh, doing doing fairly well out there right now. So uh, I guess now what we're going to do is we're going to turn into our crop scouting panel and uh, got a few questions uh, for today. Uh, first one is to John Gavlaski. I was in a field of fall right yesterday, and I was seeing some of these white type heads. Uh, John, if uh, you can help us figure out what's going on there. Yeah, and there's different possibilities with whiteheads, uh, some of them potentially being pathogen related. Uh, the one insect possibility that you'd want to check for is wheat stem maggot. And what this is, it's a fly that lays its eggs into the wheat stem. The larva lives right inside the stem. If you were to split the stem open, it would just be a small, very pale, almost has a little bit of a greenish tinge to it, uh, the larva, and it's usually in the upper part of the stem. And eventually what they do is they will sever the stem inside the, the sheath. So you can usually test for them by just giving a very gentle tug on the wheat head, or the rye head, I guess, in this case. And if the, uh, the cereal head pulls out really easily, then it's likely wheat stem maggot, and if you want to, you could slice open the stem a bit and find that maggot. If you can't easily pull the head out, then it's probably not wheat stem maggot, and then you might want to explore some of the other potential causes, such as plant pathogens. Okay, um, what surprised me is then actually when I did pull on the head, it came out fairly easy, so uh was seeing a uh, thought of wheat stem maggot, but... Uh, the first time I've ever seen it in fall rye. So is it just um, not as they don't prefer fall rye, or is it just uh, I've never seen it before? Uh, they, they they will. They they do have other hosts other than wheat. Wheat's probably the most common that we see it in, but they will um, lay their eggs in some of the other grassy weeds and some of the other cereals as well. Okay, good. Thanks, Sean. Uh, question, this one's kind of a multi-question and it's going to go to uh, Anne and to John Hurd and Marla. Uh, basically, first of all, uh, the staging, I'm thinking a lot of people are being surprised at staging of their uh, of their crop. And, uh, Anne, um, I was just wondering if you could maybe just go through some of the stages or what you're seeing the staging of some of the crop is right now. Sure. Yeah, the wheat is definitely, um, like all crops, going through the vegetative stages faster than it, you know, typically is just due to the hot, dry weather. Uh, so some of the wheat is entering flag leaf. Um, most is probably at, sorry, most is probably at stem elongation right now. So stem elongation starts, you know, is the stage after tillering, and it starts when that first node pushes out above the soil surface, and that's when those nodes start to push up and elongate the stem. Uh, so, and then 
you know, the most important stage after that would be flag leaf, which is kind of the, um, you know, the end of some herbicide applications and maybe the final point where you'd want to consider putting nitrogen on your wheat crop, but John Hurd can comment on that. So for flag leaf, it can be tricky to stage, you know, in a year like this where we're seeing a lot of really short plants, um, it can be hard to ensure that you're at flag leaf or know when that leaf pushing through out of the world is a flag. So um, at flag leaf, we will feel three nodes above the soil surface. So the first node is fairly close to the soil surface, and then the next one will be a couple of inches above that, the second node, and then the third node develops above the second. And when that third node is developed, developing, that's when that flag leaf is pushing up. So at that point, you can be fairly certain that the next new leaf that's coming out is your flag leaf. And also to ensure that that's the flag leaf, you can take a sharp, um, a sharp blade, cut along the stem of your wheat crop and see what that head looks like in there. So at flag leaf, there isn't, so uh, during the jointing stage, when you cut into the stem, you will see the developing head, but it's surrounded by the new leaves that are about to come out. At when flag leaf is just starting, the flag leaf is the next leaf that's pushing out. So you'll see the, the head, but you won't see it surrounded by another leaf. And then you can be certain that your wheat is, um, is that a flag leaf? Okay, and um, so the the plant that I have pictured there um, is um, what what um, I guess stage you would consider that is that like uh, three tillers uh, stage right now? Uh, it's t tough to tell, but if you do feel like the the easiest thing to do is to feel for those um, nodes. It, Looks like it's, yeah, at a few tillers, probably about to start um, jointing or the jointing or the stem elongation stage. So, you know, just feeling above the soil surface, usually it's about an inch above the soil surface will be your first node. And if you can't feel it, um, or if you're unsure, if you do feel that first node, just carefully strip away the leaves at the bottom of the stem. So you'll feel a couple of leaves and then there will be a leaf with, you know, it's sheathed covering that node. And then once you carefully strip those leaves away, then you'll be able to feel better if um, that node is indeed above the soil surface. You can also um, cut into your wheat plant, the main stem. So I should have mentioned that for staging, it's important to remove the tillers so that you're sure that you're just looking at the main stem. But at any point, it's interesting to split open um, the main stem of your wheat crop to see, you know, if you do see a node above the soil surface, you'll see that, you know, that circular bump um, to see where the head is and, um, you know, sometimes you could be surprised by the size of your plant and what stage it's actually at. Okay, good. Thanks, Anne. Um, next question for John Hurd and or Marla. Um, we had talked early on in webinars about split applications of nitrogen because of the, the lack of moisture. And um, what, how uh, critical is our stage in getting to right now for uh, getting that uh, last bit of nitrogen on, or um, you know, do we put the whole amount on that we were planning? Okay. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me, Lionel? You bet, John. Okay. Uh, I, I I'm encouraged looking at your plant there that you have in your hand that uh, uh, you still got that window. But I've been in uh, a wheat field here in the valley uh, yesterday that was uh, a foot high. Uh, in the boot stage, meaning the flag leaves fully emerged. And, oh boy, it's a tough call on yield potential. Uh, uh, and I suspect if that farmer didn't already have all his nitrogen on, he would be backing off his split. He's already thinking yield potential's less. What you're holding there still looks like there's good yield potential. And so the farmer, if he's withheld some of his nitrogen, may well still be wanting to go on with his full amount. And the timing for that is, uh, as Anne explained, between that stem elongation and actually that would be the, the best stage. Then we're looking at uh, our greatest yield and uh, uh, good protein uh, based on previous studies. And uh, it goes up until when that flag leaf starts to emerge. And at that point, uh, we start losing uh, nitrogen going in and making higher yield, we still get good protein. So I would be targeting the earlier stage. And again, 
it's not when you put that nitrogen on, it's when you get that rain that takes the nitrogen into the root system, that's when the plant knows it's been fertilized. So uh, uh, I would be targeting applications based hopefully on uh, imminent rainfall. And if not at this stage, you're still probably wanting to use uh, a urease inhibitor to prevent nitrogen losses if it's going to be sitting on the surface, particularly on any damp soil. But there, there's going to be some tough calls made if uh, farmers do not receive rain, if their crop is uh, a little more advanced and yield potential has been set at a lower level than what they had hoped. Uh, they may actually be looking at reducing the nitrogen that goes on in a split if they apply it at all. Uh, I'm wondering if, and you had written a nice article up as far as at what stage of the plant does yield potential get set? And I think the first stage is that tillering, but now that we're seeing stem elongation, do you want to mention when it is that a drought stressed plant starts taking off tillers and, and other aspects? Sure, yeah. Uh, so really throughout the life stage of any plant, different yield um, characteristics are going to be set. So I have heard like, you know, from the time that the wheat's emerging until the end of tillering or until tillering, the wheat's determining how many tillers or how much, how many tillers the plant can support. So since we have had some drought stressed plants, those plants will have less tillers than they would have, um, you know, in an ideal year. So I have heard of wheat with, you know, one tiller or in some areas. And so that obviously reduces yield potential by reducing the number of heads per plant. And then also even, you know, throughout stem elongation, um, if the plant is stressed, it, the wheat can still drop tillers at that stage. So just because you see a couple of healthy till healthy looking tillers on your plant, the wheat could decide or the plant could decide that it doesn't have the resources to support those tillers and could drop them. So, um, so those are the important character, the important things that are being set early on. And then also uh, the head size. So the head is developing in the stem as, um, as it's growing. Um, you know, once it enters that jointing stage, the, the head is starting to develop. Um, and then, you know, this, the actual size of the head and how many florets it has is starting to be set. So if if the plant is very stressed, then those heads will be smaller and there'll, there'll be less heads per plant. So when you're thinking about applying nitrogen and what your yield potential is, you know, if you do have less tillers than you, you know, say you normally have a wheat plant and three tillers, if you're looking at say one or two tillers, then obviously your yield potential will, will be reduced from what you would expect in a year uh, with more favorable conditions. So then that will help you decide how much nitrogen and how many resources you should be putting into that crop. Okay, so kind of almost you know, go out and count your tillers, and if you don't have a lot of tillers, then maybe you should be looking at reducing, if you were, were planning a split application, then reducing your uh, nitrogen application amount. Uh, yeah, but, but, but potentially, yes, that's the type of thing uh, you'd like to have a savvy agronomist or uh, someone with an experience uh, with you in the field. It's a tough call making these uh, your potential uh, calls at this time of year, but uh, uh, it's good to get help. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think uh, some of the uh, real early planted uh, cereals, uh, like you mentioned, uh, John, uh, are in the flag leaf stage. And I think those ones might be maybe a little easier to make a call on than the one that I'm holding in my hand right there. Hmm. Yeah, uh, good. I just mentioned as far as canola, I uh, really want to have that nitrogen on if it isn't on by the four to six leaf stage. So uh, so that means the nitrogen's hopefully uh, had a rain and gets into the root system uh, by the time you get to bolting. That's when the, the high nitrogen need is of, of canola. Uh, I've seen people do this in the past. Uh, if you're using 28%, uh, you can dribble, you can get leaf burn, but it's it's tolerable, uh, or, or ideally, if you could broadcast urea, you may have less uh, burn in the crop. Uh, but ideally, you want to get that on before uh, you get those big rosette cabbage leaves and before you start bolting. So that uh, the people, the 
canola fields I've seen are very stagey out there, uh, but I think you'd want to get it on there, uh, you know, when rain's in the forecast. Uh, question, uh, if conditions change to wetter after the cereals have terminated tillers, can plants reissue new tillers that would produce grain? Think probably uh, Anne, maybe. Sorry, Lionel, could you repeat that question? Sure. Uh, if conditions change to wetter after the cereals have terminated tillers, can plants reissue new tillers that would produce grain? Uh, yeah, like we do see, you know, if it's, if conditions have been dry and then we do see a lot of rain, we do see some of those late season tillers, but they sometimes don't actually produce heads or they do produce smaller heads. So, um, you know, they don't wouldn't contribute that much to yield, but it really depends on the time of year. So, you know, if we see favorable conditions now, we might start to see some new tillers, but those newer tillers or the later season tillers will always have smaller heads and have less, you know, less grain in them than the earlier season, more productive tillers. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Okay, this can be kind of an open question. I've been getting a few calls on this the last couple of days. Um, cresting after the three or four inch rainfall and we're seeing um, canola that was planted just before the rainfall and there's a field of barley that was planted just before the rainfall. Kind of some pictures of the cresting. Um, any comments or any uh, strategies for managing that to try to maybe uh, save it and help it get through the ground. So uh, I'll let the experience of the group and just everybody or anybody that wants to make a comment regarding what they've seen happen in the past, if you could uh, give us some input. Hey Lionel, it's uh, Dane here. Uh, so I can hey. probably talk about the canola section a little bit. Uh, if you're getting crusting on small canola, Unfortunately, there's not a lot that can be done physically to alleviate those situations. Uh, canola does not have a very strong hypocotyl in that sense, trying to push through heavily crusted soils, particularly on heavier clay land. Um, what can work sometimes is a rotary tying harrow. I don't know if many manageable farmers actually have something like that, but a light rolling over top of the surface may help break it up enough that, uh, that uh, Canola cotyledon could emerge. Um, a diamond tooth harrow may be another option to slightly disturb the soil and, and loosen that crust so a canola plant could emerge. However, keep in mind that you will be damaging a good portion of the emerging canola as well at that time. So it's a matter of weighing the risk versus the benefit. Um, will you damage more, but then potentially have a little bit of crop to cut up or not do anything and then and so not damage it at all, but the crop may not be able to push through either. The best thing we could get is a nice gentle soaking rain that loosens up and softens that crust for that canola plant to come through. Okay, yeah, and is that like a crazy harrow you're talking about, a uh, rotary harrow? Be the same uh, thing? I'm actually not familiar with that term, crazy harrow. It's, it's, um, it's a spiked tine on, on a bearing, on a yeah. shaft. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be very similar. Uh, what about rolling? A um, couple of guys have asked, uh, would rolling make any difference? I don't have enough experience to really answer that. Uh, to be honest, I'm supposed to I'm supposed to know here, but I might have to look into that a little more. Potentially, yeah. I mean, potentially it could could break up some of that crust. Just theorizing on it now, but you would also run the risk of of crushing and breaking off that hypocondal. True. Yeah. I think there might be a couple guys trying that, so I think we might see what might happen uh, with yeah. that uh, over the next uh, try, next. Try a few uh, acres and see. Yeah, do some very diligent scouting both before and after you run the roller over and see what your symptoms are like, and if that loss is acceptable to you, uh, then then uh, that would be up to the farmer's decision. Uh, 
Uh, I should mention, uh, Mar Marla and I dealt with a call like this near Brunkeld last year that got a, a heavy rain. Uh, emergence uh, ultimately ended up being slight. Uh, the farmer, it was earlier than this, but the farmer did go in and uh, reseeded uh, uh, with a disc drill, just a light bit of uh, uh, part rate of canola into that to, you know, thicken up the stand. But I think we're, we're late enough in the season that that, that that window was kind of closed for any reseeding options. That was just a, a re-thickening of the stand that was there. Yeah, and he he actually went um, perpendicular to his original seeding lines, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes, John? Um, so that he could, he damaged the stand that was there as little as possible. Okay, no, that's uh, that's not a bad idea too. I think uh, the same as most of you, uh, the pictures on the shovel there definitely are plants that are probably not going to make it. I had more hope for the the barley field uh, that's uh, on your right there. Uh, I think uh, a lot more of those plants will be be poking through over the next day or so here. And uh, and the comment about a little bit of rain would probably be our best option right there. Just uh, soften the, the soil surface a little bit so there's always something that goes uh uh happens uh one of these fields i think was uh reseeded because of uh flea beetles now so it's uh two kicks at the cat it is so uh john uh are we winning the flea beetle battle uh guys are getting sick of spraying i've had one guy spray three times already and uh this canola still looks like this. Uh, this looks actually not bad uh, now, but uh, three applications. Uh, you mentioned that uh, I think last week that we were hopefully be done by the end of June. Is that still kind of a, a forecast or? Yeah, we're probably still on target for that. And uh, winning the flea beetle battle, I guess when you're doing three foliar applications, you probably haven't won the battle, but you've preserved your crop. Um, the, the complicating factor this year was well, there's two things there was the, the high flea beetle population plus the conditions that were keeping the crops in those young stages for an extended period of time um, well, now that we're getting into the three to four leaf stage and beyond um, there will be less damage i i did hear of a couple of cases where canola in the three to four leaf stage was still being very badly damaged uh, due to some extremely high populations. So I would say still, that's a guideline, that three to four leaf stage, I would say still watch the canola. Once you get beyond that, you should be good. And the other thing that is happening, flea beetles are naturally dying out. Um, flea beetles don't lay eggs early in the season. They overwinter as adults and they come out and feed. Eggs are laid in the soil now and they will be hatching out and you'll see those flea beetles later in the summer. But the overwintered population is dying out. Um, by the end of June, levels will be really low. So another week or so, just keep an eye on things, especially if you've got canola, um, three to four leaf stage or younger. A couple comments I've been hearing from some producers is, uh, why is there so many this spring? Um, like, is it, because we're growing so much canola, or is it uh, just it was their year? Um, we've had chronically high levels for quite a few years, and I've got uh, I've been documenting um, instances that I'm aware of where people are doing multiple sprays for flea beetles, and it's become more and more common. Um, and it, it isn't something new to this year. It's again we've had chronically high levels for quite a while. And I think you might be right about there's uh, so much canola in the prairie landscape right now. Uh, we're certainly not going to be starving any flea beetles. Um, there's just an abundance of food and there isn't a key natural enemy like we have for a lot of other insects that we're kind of waiting to take that population down. Uh, our cutworm population this year was not nearly as high as um, 2020 and definitely not nearly as high as 2019, although there were some localized issues. Um, 
in a case like that, it's usually natural enemies, maybe combined with weather that take the populations down. But we don't have those key natural enemies like we do for some other groups. Bertha armyworm, if we get uh, Thrissia or um, Bankus in the population, their population crashes. But again, we just don't have that equivalent for flea beetles. Okay, one other uh, question um, um, I get to is, um, uh, are we starting to show some resistance to some of these C treatments and, uh, and or uh, insecticides? Uh, we don't have any evidence at this point of resistance. There's some baseline testing going on this year. Um, but at this point, I would say no, we don't have evidence of there being resistance in the flea beetle population. That being said, it wouldn't surprise me if it did develop um, and if we did find it soon. We're using mainly neonicotinoids repeatedly year after year on the flea beetle population. So it's a very high selection pressure when almost all the acres have the same chemical grouping on them. So again, it wouldn't surprise me if we do develop that at some point, but at this point, there isn't any evidence of there being resistance. Okay, and another one that just came in is, are you noticing, or are we noticing more stem feeding than normal uh, this year compared to other years? I can't say it's worse than normal. Um, we've had years in the past uh, recently where there's been a lot of stem feeding as well. So again, whether it's worse than normal, hard to say. Um, I think it, it probably varies a lot on your location. One of the things that might be contributing, uh, we did have a lot of very windy weather this year. And on the windy days, cool days or windy days, you don't see the flea beetles up on the plants as much, and they may be down in the cracks in the soil, feeding on the stems, um, lower on the plants. That's being tested, actually. There's a, a study going on at the University of Manitoba where they're looking at things uh, such as uh, temperature, wind speed that might contribute to stem feeding. But uh, I guess the short answer to your question is uh, it's been happening, but I don't know that it's worse than normal this year. Okay. And the other one, uh, I think you might have commented on this, but any comments on effectiveness, effectiveness of different seed coatings? Yeah, that's a tricky one too. You, you, you've you got your, your basic neonic group and then you've got your um, enhanced products, your Lumiderm, Fortenza Advanced and Buteo Start. And you do get a little bit of extra protection from them. Um, with the Fortenza and the Lumiderm, you also get some cutworm control. Uh, there was a study that Bob Elliott did in Saskatoon um, where he was comparing the neonics alone versus uh, some of the enhanced treatments. Now, Buteo wasn't around at the time, but he did not find a very significant or very long, um, I guess, extension of the control with the enhanced products. Now, certainly there's other secondary effects such as your cutworm control that I mentioned. Um, but yeah, I've, I've seen mixed data on how long uh, that additional control is for the enhanced products. Okay, great, thanks, John. I guess uh, that's uh, it for, just doing a quick check here, that's it for the questions for today. I mentioned uh, earlier on that seeding deadlines are coming up, uh, so if anybody's uh, having to do any reseeding yet or um, has questions regarding the, the seeding deadlines, there's the uh, locations of the MASC's offices, so uh, definitely get in contact with them. Um, regarding the funding for uh, water support uh, through uh, the environmental farm planning, if anybody's in need of uh, uh, wells, dugout replacements, or dugout fixing up, uh, um, the BMP 503 is what you'd be looking for, and uh, it's going to run through the environmental farm plan. 
and there's a couple of the contacts of people to contact in case you need to update your uh, environmental farm plan or if you want to know more about the, uh, the program. Uh, we're getting into, uh, well, hopefully going to get close to the end of field spraying here this coming week, but uh, the wind seems to be the factor there. Uh, the books are still available, and uh, if you want one, uh, they're again at the MASC offices or uh, call the 1844 number and they'll direct you to uh, your closest office. Uh, our ag adaptation specialists. So if you have questions, uh, please feel free to give these people a call and we'll do their best to give you a hand. And that does it for this week. Join us next week, uh, June the 23rd, uh, for the next edition of uh, Crop Talk. Thanks for attending. <laughs>